everyone, it's Pastor Brenda. Thanks for joining us here in this, in this format. Uh, we're starting a new series. We're using this book called The Cure. You want to see it? Um, we're gonna, it's a parable and a teaching at the same time. It's, it's really rich. So we're going to do some reading out of it and then some conversations out of it and some teaching out of it over the next several weeks. So you can go pick this book up yourself and read it. Um, or you can just join in on the conversations that you're having with your people. You know, get your roommates together, get your small group together, and have this conversation because um, you're gonna you're gonna really like it. So, like I said, this is a parable, and this um, it's very clever. It opens up with this question. I'm just gonna begin with this. I'm staring at this intersection like this could make it go away. That's when I noticed the tall pole with two arrows at the top pointing down each fork. What's written on them is even more confusing than the fork. One arrow pointing left reads pleasing God. The one leading right reads trusting God. You're kidding. I'm supposed to choose between these two? And thus begins the parable. So we are this mix of fear and faith. We are daily trying to figure out how to live this faith and how, to, how that looks, which then leads us to this life question. Which do you choose? Pleasing God or trusting God? Why do you have to choose? Why can't you choose both? What's going on? So I'm going to introduce to you, this is um, Jen Burton. She is one of those extraordinary teachers and she's a second grade teacher, and she's gonna read us part of this parable because she's one of those teachers who can read stories to us. So here's Jen. I don't even notice at first, but suddenly the 10 feet in front of me are going different ways. And I realize I have no idea which way to go. I'm staring at the intersection like this could make it go away. That's when I noticed the tall pole with two arrows at the top pointing down each fork. What's written on them is even more confusing than the fork. One arrow pointing to the left reads, pleasing God. The one leading right reads, trusting God. You're kidding. I'm supposed to choose between these two? I'm not doing that. Choosing one means not choosing the other. It's like being asked to choose between your heart and lungs. What I want is a bypass but there is no bypass. I look up at the sign, trusting God. This has to be a trap, a trick question. It sounds good, but it doesn't give me anything to do. It's too passive. How will I make a difference? If God and I are going to be in sync, there's got to be something more than trust. If the issue is me, I'm probably not going to figure out my destiny simply by trusting God can be trusted. I move over to the pleasing God sign pointing down the path to the left. This has to be it. After all he's done for me, the very least I can do is please him. So I set off on the path of pleasing God, shaded by towering oaks. I'm encouraged to see the path is well-traveled, beaten level with the feet of a million travelers. Many of them, in fact, are still on the path. The first group I pass is a trio of buskers, strumming guitars, and a mandolin. We nod to each other politely. A little while on, there's a family of five camping just 30 yards off the path next to a brook. Even farther, a middle-aged couple basks in the sun by the side of the road. Hello, I wave. Will I see you later on? Nope. The man is smiling but firm. We left the room of good intentions some time ago. We can't see going back. Okay, I respond confused. I'm not sure what the room of good intentions is, but not everyone wants to please God, I guess. After a long while, passing many more travelers by the wayside, I see a giant building looming in the distance. It looks like a hotel. As I get closer, I can see there's writing and bronze lettering across the front, striving hard to be all God wants me to be. Finally, something for me to do. I strive after success in my career. I strive for keeping fit. Why would it be any different with God? I draw closer and notice a door. Above the doorknob, a small ornate plaque is bolted to a very heavy wooden door. Self-effort, it reads. 
Of course, God does his part and I do mine. It's about time someone said it. I turn the handle and walk in. I'm stunned to find a huge open room filled with thousands of people. I scan the group, trying to take it all in. So these are the people really living for Jesus. Soon I notice there's a woman, a hostess maybe standing next to me. She is immaculately groomed. Every hair is perfectly in place, her makeup accentuating her features. Her smile is wide and toothy. Nothing about her seems out of place. Welcome to the room of good intentions. She says it clean and cool like she's been greeting people all her life. There's just the tiniest little shred about it that's unsettling, but I'm so excited to finally be here, I don't think much of it at all. You have no idea how long I've waited to find this place. I return her smile, grasping her primly outstretched hand. I call out to the crowd almost involuntarily. Hey, how's everyone doing? The room goes silent. It's full of beautiful people, smiling people. Some of them wear elaborately crafted masks, which is great because I love masquerades. This looks like my kind of place. One man steps forward. His smile, like the hostess, is broad. His bleached white teeth look as if they had been lined up by a ruler. Welcome, he begins shaking my hand firmly. We're fine. Thank you for asking. Just fine, aren't we everyone? A few in the crowd behind him nod, smiling along. My kids are doing great and, um, I'm about to close some very lucrative deals at work. More fit than when I was in high school, I'm telling you. I'm doing just fine. Everyone here is. Before I can reflect on how strange that sounded, the hostess asks how I'm doing. Me? Well, to be honest, I've been struggling with some stuff. That's partly why I'm here, trying to figure it out. She interrupts me, putting a flawlessly manicured index finger to her lips. She reaches behind a podium and pulls out a mask, handing it to me. She nods her head with a curt smile, indicating that I should put it on. I stare at it for a moment. Others in the room are excitedly motioning for me to do so. Slowly, I slide the mask over my face. My next thought is, it might be best to back off on the self-revelation. I find myself answering as if in, from somewhere far away. You know, I'm great. I'm doing fine. And everyone in the room smiles before returning to their conversations. This is the room of good intentions. The main entrance hall is massive and ornate. Winding stairways lead to upper halls where cascading fountains are ringed with beautifully upholstered sofas and chairs. There are doorways leading to ballrooms, dining halls, and fancily appointed living quarters. Everything is white marble and gold leaf. It's gorgeous and opulent. Across the back wall, there's a huge embroidered banner. Working on my sin to achieve an intimate relationship with God, it reads. Finally, someone's saying what I've experienced all these years. Early on, when I first believed, he and I were so close. Then over time, I kept failing. I'd do something stupid. I'd promise I wouldn't do it anymore. Then I'd fail at the same thing again and again. Before long, it felt like he was on the other side of an ever-growing pile of the garbage I'd created. I imagined him farther away each day with his arms folded, shaking his head thinking, I had so much hope for this kid, but he's let me down so many times. But looking across this room, I know I can change all that. This room, it's impressive. The decorations are nice enough, but you can feel the courage and diligence. You can almost taste the full-hearted fervency, the accomplishment, the head-on determination. There's the Fortune 500 executive who has given away 90% of his wealth to charity. There is the lead pastor of a thriving network of churches, a dynamic communicator whose theological insights are heard the world over. I meet a girl, elegant even in her simple worn clothes, who has devoted nearly all of her energy to providing medical supplies to the untouchables in Kolkata. So many good people fill this room. They have devoted themselves to God. 
to studying his character, to pouring themselves into spreading his word, to serving humanity in the name of Jesus. This must be it. Soon God and I will be so close again. Welcome back. I'm sure you guys had a lot of conversation just about that first part of our parable. Um, I get it. We, we did too. and We did this together. Um, there's just, I mean, we could almost be like, amen, done. That was good teaching for the night. So let me just give you a couple things to think about, to chew on a little bit in a little scripture. Um, the path of pleasing God leads you to the room of good intentions. Interesting name, huh? You pleasing God equals good intentions. And across that home, that house, or whatever it is, it says, striving hard to be all God wants me to be. Yeah. That sounds responsible for your life, right? That sounds what you should be doing as a Christian, right? And this thing about, because God did his part and I should do mine, just like in the story there, that just felt right. Like, like, what can I do to love this gracious God back? I need to do my part. And because I'm struggling with sin, so what can I do to, to do my part back for God? And then you get into the room and there's a banner that says, working on my sin to achieve an intimate relationship with God. Again, this sounds so responsible. You are working on your sin. And isn't that what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian? This is your responsibility? Yet, and we're, we're only beginning, you guys, with this. You feel the weight in that room of what that really means. It means you can't be authentic. You got to put that mask on. It means... Um, if someone, you know, you blurt out and say like, I'm not having a good day, someone's gonna hand you a mask. And did you notice at the very end there, the amount of people there who are doing really great things in the name of God, who are stuck in this room, because you might have figured out this is not the right place to be. Um, so let me read to you Ephesians 3, 11 and 12. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This way of faith is very different from the way of law, which says, it is through obeying the law that a person has life. This is the, the two rooms. We're going to get to the second room next week. Hebrews eleven six. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith. That's how that begins. Um, just interesting, that word in Hebrew, that word faith there actually means trust. So some translations put that in there, and I think that would be a little bit helpful here. Um, we've just finished a series all about our trust issues with God. It's called We Are a Mix of Fear and Faith. You can find it here on the YouTube channel. Um, but we just had this, all this really good teaching and conversations about our trust issues with God. And it's interesting that until you trust God, nothing you do will please God. It comes in that order first. But the responsible thing we think comes into pleasing God, striving to do all that we can to show that we please God, and working on our sin. I'm going to leave you with a couple questions, and I'll see you next week as we continue on in our story. All right, so have these questions with your people. When you think of things you need to take care of in order to be closer to God, what comes to mind? How do they affect your faith or relationship with God? When you're doing these striving things, because you feel it's the responsible thing to do, how does that really affect your relationship with God? 
You might want to take that one home with you and pray about it too for a while. There's some digging there that needs to be done. And the second question I want to leave you with. Why might the enemy want you to focus on trying to fix your sin? There's a lot in that one too. Let me repeat that. Why might the enemy want to keep you focused on trying to fix your sin. All right. If you're curious, you can pick this up and go ahead and read ahead. Otherwise, join us next week and we'll continue this conversation. We're going to continue some aha moments with very clever writing. Um, and we're going to find a whole lot of trust. Thanks for joining us. Bye.